Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for joining today's 2021 budget webinar. Um, today, we're looking to achieve the impossible, which is one, make the news exciting and two, uh, make it easy to navigate. And um, I've got no better person to work with on that than Chris Brown from Lutia in Singapore. Um, good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thanks for inviting um, me along. So Chris, we, we've been working uh, with Chris for, gosh, over 20 years. And, and actually, we were just talking offline that I think we did this first, um, uh, well, it wasn't a webinar back then. It was a presentation in a hotel about 10 years ago in Hong Kong, how, how times have changed. Um, Chris himself used to work for HMRC in the UK. Um, he then went on to work for Ernst & Young. Um, He's now a chartered tax advisor, amongst other things. So really, there's there's no better person than to be partnered with today than Chris, um, who will be able to talk through, from his point of view, the most important aspects of the, the budget in 2021. And most importantly, uh, we'll be here to answer some questions at the end. So just on that note, in terms of general housekeeping, um, today I'll, I'll give a brief introduction on IP Global. I think most of you know who we are. I'll then hand over to Chris. Um, there will be a couple of poll questions um, in the meantime and plenty of time for questions at the end. And also we can make these slides available. So there's no need to sort of write furiously as you're listening. We will be able to send these out to anyone that, that, that wants them. So before I start and give a, a brief introduction on, on IP Global, could we have our first poll question, please? Should be coming up soon. Um, basically, it's the choices of where, um, yes, that was it, where would you most likely invest within the UK in 2021? Um, so we've got London, UK commuter towns, Birmingham, Newcastle, Leeds and Manchester. So just choose one. Um, I mean, obviously, over the last few years, it hasn't just been London that's been a massive choice for investors. Uh, we've been looking further afield up in Birmingham, Newcastle, Manchester, um, where there have typically been lower ticket price points and, and better yields. And with all the regeneration that's been going up in those areas, property prices have performed very well and, and still have plenty to go. So um, where would you think that you might invest in 2021, given the choice? I'll just give you a, a few more seconds to put your votes in. Clearly, as a business, we're looking to offer um, the best information, the best advice, but we are client-led to an extent. We're obviously listening to what, what you, the investor, wants too. So it's important information to know. I think London itself has probably paused for breath. Do we, do we have the results yet? Or should we come back to those? We'll come back to those. Okay, so before I introduce you over to Chris, let me give you a brief introduction, please, on, on IP Global um, and, and how we operate. So first slide, please. Essentially, yeah, we're, we're creating wealth through intelligent property investment. We want to help people build property portfolios. Some people are starting from scratch. Some people are adding to investments that they've already made over the years, but ultimately, the common goal here is to present property for pure investment. We're not trying to sell places to live or places to go on holiday. It's income producing assets that will, will, will increase in, in capital values over the years. So pure and simple, that's what we're focused on. Next slide, please. So in terms of the services that we offer, what, what we're saying, it's an end-to-end -end service. Um, so amongst other things, we're providing mortgage uh, advice. I mean, these days with interest rates so low, um, it's absolutely key to get the right mortgage advice. Um, interest rates are likely to stay low for some time, I, I think is a fair, a fair assumption to make. Yes, there's talk of inflation, but property prices um, and inflation, uh, uh, sorry, and, and interest rates clearly are, are, are linked. Um, and with interest rates staying as they are, it makes absolute sense, both from a tax perspective and also from a leveraged return perspective to, to take out um, mortgages where you can. Lettings and management, that's another big piece of what we do. 
Um, any of you that have tried it, it's the world's worst job to try and do from overseas. Very difficult. Great when things go as they should, not so good when you get problems. So we have uh, our own company on the ground um, to take care of that, to find you tenants, to manage those tenants, to make sure that the money is paid into your account um, and really take as much admin off your desk as possible. Resales is another piece. I mean, you might want to sell the investment five years down the line um, and realize some of your gains and reinvest it. You might want to re to remortgage. And that's back to the, the first point of the, the, the mortgage finance. So generally speaking, we're here to offer um, help in every single piece of the whole transaction to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. Just before I hand over to Chris, I was looking at some, some numbers yesterday and you know, it's quite unbelievable the shock that we've been through with this whole global pandemic. I mean, within the UK, the whole economy has shrunk from 2020 to 2021 around 10%. I mean, that's probably bigger than what happened in the Second World War in relative terms over a short period of time. But um, the key thing is that the vaccine rollout in the UK is, I think, probably the best in Europe just now. I mean, We've had our challenges, no question. There are still some challenges to come. But as a result, um, most forecasts are suggesting that the UK will come out of this first um, and in better shape. So already in 2021, we're looking at 4% growth, a significant 7.3% growth in 2022. And obviously with that comes growth in asset prices. And in terms of relevance today, growth in property prices I think is, is what we're looking at in most regions up and down the UK. We can talk more about that um, a little bit later. Um, but that's all for me. Let me just hand over now to, to Chris, um, who will talk to you about the specifics of, of what's been happening in the budget in the last month or so. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for turning up. Um, I'm a UK Chartered Tax Advisor. I, Jonathan says I've been working with, uh, with him for for many years and, and Lutia and IP Global have also been working together for, for many years. Um, Lutia is, is a boutique trust company, um, but, but the people who, who own and run the business are, and the directors of the business are, are, are a mix of chartered tax advisors, lawyers and, 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 and chartered accountants. So, so, so we basically manage people's wealth for them um, and we're able to provide advice in, in relation to the, the structuring of that wealth and, and general estate planning and because of our UK our UK, um, where we come from, and then our UK background, the UK tax is, 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 is our specialty. Uh, next slide. So the 2021 budget announcements, <coughs> there were lots. Um, it was a big book. Um, lots of tax stuff. Some stuff wasn't there. Um, we've kind of focused on the things that specifically relate to, to, to UK property and, and residential property for the purpose of this webinar. Um, so firstly, there were there were, there were rate freezes for income tax, capital gains tax, or the allowance freezes, uh, and inheritance tax, basically a four-year freeze, although there were some increases. Uh, a, a, a new guarantee from the government, not specifically uh, aimed at, at property investors, but, but relevant for, for, for home buyers, um, a, a guarantee of up to 95% mortgages to, to encourage movement in the market. Um, an increase in corporation tax rate. This could be relevant for, for some of you if you own property in the UK through a company then the, and, and if your profits are over a certain limit in 2023, the tax rate is going to increase from 19 to 25%. And there was, there was, there was confirmation in the budget that, that there will be tax policy consultations um, released, uh, the subject the, the res result of a, of a tax policy review that was issued or commissioned by Rishi Sunak last year, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll hear about on March the 23rd. Star of the show, I think, is probably stamp duty land tax holiday. Um, it's been extended, the, 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 the tax-free £500,000 stamp duty rate ban, um, which was due to close on the 31st of March, has been extended for up to six months. And finally, it wasn't necessarily wasn't actually announced in the budget. It, it was announced a year ago, but but there is an additional two percent stamp duty land tax uh, payable for for non UK resident investors in, in in UK property. So I'm going to touch on that as well in the presentation. So firstly, the uh, the, the allowance the allowance uh, uh, freezes. You've got income tax, capital gains tax, inheritance tax. The personal allowance for 
for UK income tax, which 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 applies to UK residents and to those investors who who don't live in the UK but carry a UK passport, has been increased by two hundred and seventy pound to twelve thousand five hundred and seventy from the sixth of April two thousand twenty one, and it will be frozen at that rate for four years. Capital gains tax exemption again has been increased by the same amount two hundred and seventy pound from twelve thousand five hundred and seventy. It's £6,150 for trustees. Uh, again, that's frozen. The nil rate ban for inheritance tax. Inheritance tax, you may be aware, is, is a UK tax payable on death. And if you're, a, if you're an investor in the UK, then, then you have a UK cited asset. Therefore, in the event of your death, that's within the scope of inheritance tax. Uh, currently, the, the nil rate ban, which is the tax exempt amount, is £325,000. That's, that's remaining the same and it's going to be frozen for four years. And, the £175,000 residence nil ban, which is an addition to that, um, doesn't really apply to overseas investors or, or resident investors. It, it applies to the to the family home, but some of you may end up living in the UK. It could be relevant, and it basically extends to three twenty-five to half a million pound when you pass your home down to down to your direct descendants. That's frozen as well. The capital gains tax rate uh, remains at the at eighteen percent for, for for the lower rate. <clears throat> and 28% and for the higher rate. So, so if, you, if you make a capital gain on a sale of a property and, and it's less than £50,000 currently, um, then, then the rate is only 18%. If it's over that, the tax rate is 28%. Um, could change in the future, but that, there was no change in the budget. So the 95% loan to value mortgage guarantee um, it has been issued by the government. It applies from the 6th of April 2021. It was. Um, it, it's. It, it's aimed really just at people buying homes. That I think the idea is to is is to encourage people to continue to to buy and continue to borrow. Um, it, it it applies to um, six hundred thousand pound. That's that's the cap. Um, it, it's not for second homes. It's not for buy to lets. It, it's purely just for for people that are people that are, are buying a home. <clears throat> In fact, it's, it's interesting. It's only the top. The gov the government will guarantee ninety one to ninety five percent most banks are probably lending up to 80 so they're trying to encourage banks to lend more as well to, to, to get more more movement in that respect so corporation tax the the, the third point here is um, due to increase to 25 percent from 19 percent it's, it's, it's a hefty hike um, there's two years grace doesn't apply from until the 1st of April 2023 it's aimed at general businesses in the UK um, and in, in this next two years running up to it there are actually lots of concessions as well um, you know, 130 percent deductions for, for, for certain purchases by the business, that sort of thing. Um, I just extracted the pieces which are relevant for, for property, property investors. Um, so, so, so it does apply to all companies um, which are subject to corporation tax. So that could be a UK company that you own to buy your property through. It could be a, a non-UK resident, a BBI Hong Kong company, something else. As long as it's a company, then it falls within the scope of this. The 25% tax rate will only apply to profits over £250,000. So, so, and, and that's that's net profit. So, so, so that's that that's profit after deduction of loan interest and, and all other running expenses of the of the business. So, so that, that, that that's a sizable property portfolio for this to be able to this to actually hit you at the top rate. Um, for profits under £50,000, which, which probably a, a lot of people will fall into if they are using a company. Again, that's net profits. The, the tax rate will stay the same. It will still be nineteen percent. If there is, if 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 there is, um, if your profits fall between the two, there's going to be a, a, a phased in um, relief. <clears throat> so, which means that it's tapered in. So, you know, you you've got nineteen percent. You've got twenty five percent. If your profits are say. 100,000, you'll probably be paying 21%, 21 and a half. We, we don't know just yet exactly how that's going to work out, but it'll be kind of tapered up. And again, that, that's not until the 1st of April 2023. But if you if you use a company, um, it's, it's something you'll need to think about. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier the tax policy consultations. Basically, <clears throat> Rishi, it's interesting, just, just the point is that we, we've been we are currently in in a 15 year period of tax simplification in the UK and, and, and people like me have never been busier trying to understand what's going on. It, it's got more and more, more and more complicated. Um, so, so, so a year ago, the Chancellor said, you know, I, I want a review of the tax policy. I want to look at income tax, I want to look at capital gains tax. 
want to look at inheritance tax um you know we we, we need to we need to really think about this um of course covid's happened since then <clears throat> the review has been done uh, and and we were advised in the budget that on the 23rd of march um we will we will get the result of that and that certain consultation papers um will be issued um what's in the consultation papers we don't know yet we can only speculate um you know in the run-up to this budget people were were saying you know will the capital gains tax rate go up uh, will there will be, will there be a, a wealth tax? Um, you know, a, there was a review on wealth tax, and it was suggested by by the the people that did the review that a one-off wealth tax um, based on UK assets should be introduced. Um, we don't know. There's going to be a period, whatever it is. Um, you know, there will be a period of consultation. The law in the UK says that tax can't be retrospective, although that's been kind of pushed to the pushed to the line the last few years. There's this thing called retroactivity now, but generally there's at least a six month period of consultation so so whatever is the result of that is that is probably likely to take effect from um from the 6th of april although you know we do have two budgets a year now there could be a november budget that could come in then we'll have to wait and see so the stamp duty land tax holiday extension many of you would have probably benefited from this um you'll, you'll remember that, that, that basically in July 2020, it was announced that the first £500,000 in value of UK residential property purchases would be free of stamp duty land tax. Um, basically, that saves £15,000 in tax um, for an individual uh, buying their first property. So that was going to that was going to run out on the 31st of March, but you know, what with COVID-19 and, and, and people, lawyers and, and, and agents not being able to process the work, people not being able to visit the properties. Uh, there's a huge backlog. So I'm advised by Jonathan in, in, in the actual process of, of, of the sales. So, so, so this has been extended now to 30th of June. So it's a three month reprieve, um, which is hopefully time enough for people to get their, get their completions across the line. <clears throat> Over and above the 500,000 pound, there's a tiered rate which goes up to 1.5 million pounds. So it's 5% from 500 to 925,000 pounds. It's 10% up to one and a half million pounds and it's 12% over 1.5 million pounds. They're the usual rates um, which, which applied before, before July, 2020. And they're the usual rates which will apply after this period has ended. So, so, so instead of just withdrawing the a half a million pound holiday um, on the 30th of June, the, the government has decided to to bring it in slight, slightly, they're just reducing it by half. So, so, so it will be reduced to two hundred and fifty thousand pound if you, if you complete on your purchase between the first of July and the thirtieth of September this year. <clears throat> That's still going to create you a saving. You'll you'll save two thousand five hundred pounds in in stamp duty um, if you if you complete during that period if you're an individual. Um, the usual rates apply again over over that limit. So from two fifty up to nine hundred twenty five thousand pound, your rate is five percent. 10 and 12 up to a million and over 1.5 million <clears throat> then from the 1st of october 2021 <clears throat> we're back to um back to where we started in july so your first 125,000 pound of, of of value is tax free um then the next 125,000 pound is at two percent five percent up to 925 ten percent up to a million and 12 percent over that <clears throat> if you're um if you're buying your second property or you've got other properties out elsewhere in the world um that then you know if you're in that category of people you'll be paying an extra three percent that, that's been in, in in play for quite some time <clears throat> so those those amounts are just increased by three percent but essentially every, everybody can make a saving if they complete before the 3rd of september 2021 <clears throat> so that there's there's also a 2% penalty rate for non UK residents. This is likely to apply to a lot of people watching this watching this this webinar. It, it, it's not new, it wasn't announced in the budget, but it does come in on the 1st of April. So really, this is just a reminder. It's a bit sneaky, really, on the part of the government, they know there's huge overseas investment into the UK. I, I think I saw I saw something on the TV last night that saying that in the last seven out of the last eight years, Hong Kong and China have been the biggest investors in the property market in the UK. <clears throat> so it's an easy win for them. We'll, we'll slap an extra couple of percent on the overseas purchases. Um, it, it's, it's so it's it, it's easy easy for them. The, the way that it works is it, it, that whatever whatever rate you would pay up until now, it, it's just an extra two percent. So if if you're in the stamp duty holiday period, 
<clears throat> when ordinarily that you would pay zero percent and you'll pay two percent if you're someone who's paying more than an extra three percent because it's a it's an additional property or you're buying through a company then if, if you're overseas you pay two percent on top <clears throat> what this means um is, is that the just just out of interest really the the, the highest stamp duty rate payable for a residential property now will, will be increased to set will, will be 17 percent and then that, that will be someone who's buying a property worth more than 1.5 million pound who is is overseas and and it's it's an additional property of theirs or, or it's an overseas company or and and this is a point worth noting i i know there's a i did a webinar recently with, with, with a chat from get ground um, which, which, which is an interesting business, which uh, uses UK properties in, in quite a, an interesting way and a good value way to, to, to buy your properties in the UK, UK company. If you're an overseas shareholder and director of a UK company, then this extra 2% could apply to the purchase by that company as well. Next slide. So what can we take away from this? Basically, there are stamp duty land tax savings still to be had by everyone, Wh whichever category you fall in, there's 15, two and a half or, or even 25,000 pound savings to be made um, if, if you buy, um, if you buy before 3rd of September, specifically if, if you're an overseas buyer um, and you buy before the 31st of March, then you could save up to 25,000 pound because the maximum rate will be 40,000 pound after that, after, after October. There's, um, I mean, some of you might, <clears throat> you, you might fall into these categories. There could be a stamp duty save, saving, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you can't complete in the time, but, but it's, there's a certainty that, that the, the purchase will go ahead um, and, and your risk is, is, is considered not very high. Um, I, I've been advised that it would be possible to, to secure a stamp duty because it's payable on consideration. So although you don't actually complete on the purchase, if you make an advance payment and pay all of the consideration before, the relevant date, 31st of March, 30th of June, um, then then the stamp duty would be, be payable on the value on that date, and you could save some money. So so you know if if you're spending considerable money, you could make considerable savings. And that's back over to you now, Jonathan. That's the end of my my talk. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, as predicted, there's a lot of questions coming through from that. Um, before we start on the questions, we've actually got another poll question um, that we're going to bring up now. And I think we've probably got the answers from the other poll too. So can we have our second poll question up, please? Um, so based on what people have read and, and certainly what Chris has said there, um, the question is, do you think that the recent UK budget has been positive or negative for investment in the UK property market? Um, so either you think it's been helpful or, or you don't think it's been helpful. Um, I was just talking to Chris offline about that. And, you know, we, we feel probably there's more positive than negative. I mean, there's been no, no big things. Um, but um, in, in terms of the sort of overall buying property and is it still as investor friendly in the UK? I think the answer is probably yes, personally, um, but some people's answers may differ. So it'll be interesting to see see what people think. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll get stuck into some questions. So a couple more, 10, 15 more seconds for that. And then we'll, um, we'll start away with some questions. Gosh, there's 200 people participating today. So that's certainly one of our highest headcount for the year. So you're a very popular man, Chris, obviously. Thank you. I feel like a good bit of free tax advice. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, I think moving on to the next question. The first question. Um, should I still buy a single property in a limited company structure or should I buy it in my own name? So that's one that's 
consistently cropped up over the years. Chris, what would you say on that? Should I buy in a company or buy my own name if I'm just buying one or two com or, or one or two properties? Um, it's a good question. Um, not a straightforward answer necessarily. Um, if you're if you're a British citizen um, or not, and if you're married, um, it is probably going to probably going to answer the question for you. Um, <clears throat> so, for instance, every individual who's a UK citizen is entitled to twelve thousand five hundred twelve thousand five hundred seven seven five hundred seventy pounds um, purse allowance. So, if you're a husband and wife and you're going to buy a property jointly or two properties jointly, that's twenty five thousand pounds tax free net income that you can have in one year before you start to pay tax. Um, so and, and that's that, that that's after after deductions and allowances. Um, you don't get a full deduction for you for your loan interest, but you do get a tax credit for the full amount. So if if if, if your if your income is within that, then you're going to have no tax to pay. So, so 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 you need to look at what the net income would be for that one or, or those two properties. Really, if it's within twenty five thousand pound and you're British, it, it, you know, and and, and that's going to be the extent of your investment. Then it's it's a bit of a no brainer. You, you, you buy in joint names. Um, a company doesn't have such a such such an, such allowances. Um, although it, you know it, it, it does get uh, it's easier to offset loan interest and, and what have you. But 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 essentially, um, I mean, if if you're not British, <clears throat> if you're foreigners, uh, you don't get the allowances either. Um, so so, that, so then it's a case of what well are you borrowing to buy the property? Uh, if you're borrowing to buy the property and the income is going to be high, um, that then there could be a restriction in the loan interest relief you'll get as an individual. Therefore, a company could be the right way to go. Okay, thank you. Just, just my take on that. I mean, it's worth adding a couple of points. Um, anyone with an EU passport still benefits from the UK tax allowance. Um, if you have a BNO passport rather than a British passport, you do not um, benefit from that UK tax allowance. So it's just a couple of points there. Mm -hmm. And then just on what Chris was saying about mortgages, um, yes, you can get a mortgage through a limited company structure, um, but I think there's a little bit more flexibility if you're buying in your own name. So what I would generally say is, and I think Chris would probably concur with this, if you're looking at buying a you know, significant um, property portfolio or accumulating a property portfolio over time, 5, 10, 15 properties, um, then I do think it would be worth going the, the corporate structure route. But I think the, the, the sort of standard retail investor approach, one, two, three properties in the UK, net, net, it's probably not worth it once you factor in um, all of the costs of, associated with running um, and basically the, the sort of cost benefit analysis from from there so I think if you're staying relatively small by your own name if you're if you're looking to sort of scale up significantly um, I think the corporate structure is the way to go yeah um, I, I agree with that it, it was interesting actually what you were saying Chris in in, in that um, in, in your summary I mean clearly um, the, the bottom end of the market is being um, favoured in, in terms of the, the sort of the benefits going on both with the 95% mortgages and also the stamp duty. So anything up to the sort of five, six hundred thousand pound range, that end of the property market is being supported extremely hard now. And that's good because that's typically where investors fall um, in, in terms of the price point and certainly what we're doing. So clearly that end of the market is, is, is being supported for, for the time being. Um, another question. Um, if I was to buy property, a completed property um, in the next month or so, um, doesn't give any sort of specifics. So I guess what, what this, this, um, this, this chap was, is asking is if I was to buy in the reasonably short term, would I still benefit from stamp duty savings? Chris, what yes. would you say? The, the, the answer is yes. Um, the, the, the initial period went to 31st of March. Now it's extended to 30th of June. Um, and, and even you know it doesn't matter what category of the buyer you fall into whether you're an individual it's your first property whether it's an additional property or, or, or whether you're overseas you will still make a save okay so in other words if you're buying something that's completed um you, you've got time because yeah then there, there was concern that there was this sort of log jam with lawyers and banks and bank valuers that everything wasn't going to get through by the end of march um it, it's fortunate for us i mean we still have um, developments that um, we firmly believe in um, that, that are completed now. Um, some are absolutely 
within London itself. Um, some are on the sort of outskirts, um, this commuter belt, which is definitely sort of increasing in popularity as I think people work out that actually they don't need to be in London five days a week and maybe, you know, they just have to travel in two, three days a week, in which case the commuter areas are really starting to come into their own. Um, so for those of you that are interested in taking advantage of the um, stamp duty holidays, definitely speak to us because we do have opportunity there um, for you. Um, another question, um, am I still able to, off if I'm an offshore investor, am I still able to offset my mortgage interest against my income within the UK? I think that's up to a certain point, isn't it, Chris? Yes. Basically, if, if, if you're if you're a basic rate taxpayer, uh, me, means your 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 net income before loan interest uh, is is within is less than thirty seven thousand five hundred. If 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 you're not a British person, but if you're or you don't have a, an allowance, if you have a personal allowance of fifty thousand pounds, then you'll still get relief. The, the last four years has been the tapering out of, of relief by way of deduction. So if you've got fifty thousand pounds worth of rent, thirty thousand pounds worth of loan interest. You take the 30 from the 50 you've got 20 left you knock your allowance off that if you've got one or otherwise pay tax on that less any other deductions <clears throat> um they've phased that out now what they do is, is they give you a tax credit so if your if your mortgage interest is thirty thousand pound then and your tax rate is 20 then they don't take off the mortgage interest you take off the other deductions you charge take off your allowance if you have one you charge tax at 20 percent and then you take 20% of the 30,000, that's a tax credit, it reduces the tax due. The, the, if there's anything left, you, you pay tax on it. If, it. if it's more, then you get a carry forward to the following year. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I, I think the, just to add to that, most overseas investors, unless they've got meaningful income coming out of the UK, are probably gonna fall below um, a high rate taxpayer bracket. So therefore, they will still be able to offset their interest against um, their income. The issue is if you're living and working in the UK and you're earning an income and you've got a supplementary income from your property on top of that, that probably takes you up into the upper bands. But for the majority of overseas investors, you're still able to, um, to do the offsets as you were before. Um, yeah, just to add to that, Jonathan, if, if you're, you know, if, if, you're, if you own a property jointly, husband and wife, and, 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 and you are, you happen to be British or, or you have an EU passport and you can get the benefit of your allowances. Um, you know, you're talking about £100,000 worth of income. Um, you know, so, 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 you know, a lot of people fall into that bracket. Yeah. And also, I mean, I noted you said earlier on about the increase in corporation tax from 2023. But if you're earning £50,000 or below um, from mm -hmm. your, your net income, so obviously you can still offset within a company structure. Um, you're still paying that, um, that, that basic rate of 19%, aren't you? So again, I, I think the majority of retail property investors will not have that tax hike um, that, that's been announced that, that's coming into play in 2023. Yes, yes, correct. Um, question here, not necessarily on tax. It says, will the 95% mortgage availability have the potential to create a property bubble and how does that affect investment properties? That's probably one for me to answer. Um, I think the first thing to point out is that there is a time limit attached to this 95% um, mortgage and that's for the end of next year. So it's not gonna go on indefinitely. That said, um, the, the, the Bank of England may in their wisdom consider that it's, it's a good thing to have and, and actually it hasn't been abused and it is really supplementing the people that need help. So therefore they may keep it going. Um, but the key thing is, I, I'm, I don't think it'll, it'll cause a property bubble because it's only available for a certain type. I mean, don't forget, first time buyers um, below £600,000. So any of you that are thinking that you might be able to get a 95% mortgage on the, the third or fourth property in your portfolio, unfortunately you're going to be disappointed. Um, and it's only available to, to residents within the UK as well. So um, it's not as if it's sort of blanket approach to give everyone access to 95% mortgage, in which case, yeah, there, there could be a concern. Um, it's very much targeted, I think, at those at the, those that need it. Um, so, um, so, 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 so that's that. Um, what's another one? 
Uh, gosh, there's a lot of questions here coming through. Um, interest rates. Where do we think interest rates will be heading in the next two to three years? Um, I wish I knew for sure. Um, but I think a, a key indication from the banks is that what they're prepared to, to fix mortgages at. I mean, I'm currently in the UK. Um, I was talking to a bank the other day about buying a property. Um, they're prepared to offer a fixed term mortgage uh, of 1.6% for five years. Um, so obviously that's significantly lower than it's, it's ever been. But more importantly, um, they're prepared to commit to that for five years. And that would suggest um, that, you know, looking forward, uh, the market is suggesting that the interest rates are probably going to stay fairly static. Um, there is discussion of inflation around. Um, that's not necessarily such a bad thing. Um, but I think with interest rates where they are, um, many economies, many governments really haven't got much choice but to keep it as, as, as the same as they are because things are still fairly fragile. I mean, we're not yet out of this predicament through, through COVID. Um, so it, it's very likely, I think, that mortgage rates, interest rates are, are going to stay where they are. Um, and another question. Um, could you briefly explain the inheritance tax allowances in, in the UK, yes. both for single and married people? Yes, of course. Um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, inheritance tax is, is, is a tax payable on debt. It's, it's at the ghastly rate of 40%. Um, it, and, and it's 40% on the, on the net value of, of the estate. If, if, if you don't live in the UK, you're not a UK domiciled person, then it's the value of your UK estate. Um, and, and the allowance is £325,000 per individual. Um, if you're married um, and, and you leave, so, so let's say there's a property worth £500,000 in the UK after you know, net value after mortgages in the event, of the death of, of, of a husband and wife. So, so, so if, if it's a joint owned property and, and, and the, 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 the share of the, of the deceased passes to the survivor, then it passes automatically on death, first point. Second point is that there's a spouse exemption and, and, and between two people who are both UK domiciled or, or, or two people who are both not UK domiciled. Um, and that is to say domicile means basically your permanent home. So if, if, if you're, you know, Bill and Wilma living in the UK and then and one of them dies and the family home passes to the survivor, they're both UK domiciled, it's their permanent home. So, so there's an unlimited spouse exemption on the first death. The same applies to, 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 to foreigners who live overseas that just happen to have an investment in the UK. Um, that means they're not domiciled in the UK, but they've got an asset there. Uh, if it passes from one to the other on the first death, then there's no tax on the first death. And, and then what happens is that the unused £325,000 of the person that's died rolls forward to the survivor. And then on the second death, the property may well have gone up in value. Um, and, and, and then let's say it's worth £750,000 when, when the survivor of the couple dies. Then, then in, in that estate, they'll have two, two nil rate band exemptions, £325,000 for the first and, and also for the second. So there'll be a combined exemption of £650,000 to knock off the £750,000 value of the property, which is going to leave £100,000, which will be taxed at 40%. Sure. And it's worth, it's worth pointing out as well that it's only on, on equity. So if you've got some debt within the, the property, that's, that, that's helpful. Um, yes, got a question here. Um, would I, how would I be eligible for the stamp duty saving? Is that on exchange of contract or completion? That is on completion of the property. Um, so at the moment, um, if you complete on a property before the end of June, you will benefit from that, um, that stamp duty saving. Um, gosh, what else have we got here? Um, if my, if I have a British passport and my partner does not, what is your advice for the ownership structure? Um, good question. It, 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 again, it's going to depend, I think, on the, on the value of the property and, and also the level of income that, that you're looking to, 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 to achieve in terms of rents after the deduction of agency fees and, and, and other expenses. Um, if, you know, if, if, if your rents are more than, I mean, if the rents are, uh, are going to be less than or around £12,000, £12,500 a year net, then it makes sense to buy in your own name. 
um, you know, if the rents are going to be more, then, you know, to buy in joint names, obviously what you're going to do is you're going to share the rent in half. So, so basically, I, I guess that the, the, the property, the rental income needs to be worth twice the value of the personal allowance to make it worthwhile putting it in joint names, because otherwise the, 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 the spouse who doesn't have the personal allowance is going to pay basic rate tax straight off anyway. Um, so, so you may as well have it in, in your name. Um, because you'll get the full offset of the personal allowance. Right. Does that okay. make sense, Gordon? You follow that, Gordon? Yeah, no, that, 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 that makes ab absolute sense. Um, quick question on UK commercial property space post COVID following a change in work practice. Do we think long term um, that you can currently get a discounted commercial property and things will shift back to office working? Um, I think. You know, we're already seeing, I mean, we're a year down the line, effectively, when working from home was pretty much compulsory, certainly in the UK. Um, and as I heard it termed the other day, it's not it's not working from home, it's living at work. So there's a lot of people <laughs> sort of sick and tired of seeing the same four walls every day and frankly can't wait to get back into the office. So um, I think what we're looking at is, is more of a sort of hybrid situation where there will be less time spent in the in, in, in the office going forward. Um, and that obviously opens up opportunities, I think, where people live. Um, I mean, one of the questions that, uh, that I saw that has been asked is, where do we see the growth opportunities within the UK? I mean, that's inevitable for, for us as an investment business. Um, but for us, you know, clearly things have changed. Um, you spoke to someone about investing in the UK 20 years ago. Um, and it was all about London and that was it. Um, nowadays, if you look at, you know, the investment destinations and where the best performances be, many of these commuter belts around London. Um, so if you're looking at 20, 30, 40 minute travel times into London, you might groan if you had to do that every day. Um, but now if you only have to do that two, three days a week, um, that makes life a lot more manageable. Um, and obviously you have the benefit of looking outside in those commuter commuter zones um, as they're much cheaper um, and from an investor standpoint the yields are much better too so High Wycombe for example 30 minutes into Marlebone um, that's a, a project that we're, we're very much focused on at the moment which ticks those e exact boxes. Further afield um, there's still a great story um, in Manchester, Birmingham, Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle um, this whole concept of what we're calling it in the UK, North Shoring, which is basically companies moving to northern cities to benefit from the, um, basically the cheaper ways to employ people. Um, I mean, historically, people would study in the north where it was cheaper and then go into the south, um, go and get work in the south where they could earn more. And over probably the last four or five, four or five years, many employers have cottoned on to the fact that if they then move to these university towns and employ people at source, uh, they can employ just the same people, not pay them as much uh, and, and pay less for the um, commercial office space as well. So really that's fueled a lot of growth into these northern cities. For us, Birmingham still remains a focus. We're a little bit wary of parts of Manchester, which seems to have really taken off. And I would question some of the affordability. Um, but parts of Birmingham, um, Sheffield, Nottingham is another market that we're looking at, Newcastle. Um, there seems still to be um, clear, um, clear signs of value up there, and many of them are not yet at the, at the, the stage that they were um, just before the sort of 2008 crisis. So many of them are still below the prices that they peaked at in 2007, um, 2008. Um, so um, I hope that answers your question. But generally speaking, for us, we're seeing London sort of pausing for breath just now. Um, but the view is that London will, its time will come again and, and we absolutely, uh, we will be sure that we're well positioned to take advantage of the, the next wave of growth from that. Um, another question, um, can a 95% mortgage, or we're back onto the 95% mortgages again, uh, be transacted through a limited company stroke buy to let? Um, I don't think so. I think that was a secondary, uh, not available for secondary properties. Is that right, Chris? Yes, correct. It, 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 it's for people buying a home to live in um, and, and, and not a second property, additional property either. So, it, you know, it's first time buyers, basically. 
Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, another question, does the stamp duty extension cover properties or land um, or both? Is it both land and properties, Chris, or, or just property? It's, this is all to do with residential property. Um, so, so, so it's it, it, it stamp duty on, on, on residential properties. Um, if, if you're buying land to build a residential property on, I'm not entirely sure um, off, off the top of my head, but, but essentially this is all aimed at, at buying residential property. Right, okay, okay. Um, um, it says, what about people holding indefinite leave to remain in, in the UK? Um, in, in, but this is another a question. Um, bit of a difficult one to answer because I think a lot of it does depend on the passport you're holding, doesn't it, Chris? Is this in terms of being able to claim a personal allowance? I think so, yeah. Uh, okay, so... so if you're living in, if, I mean, if you have indefinitely to remain in the UK, then it's likely you're going to be UK resident. It may be that you spend less than 120, 90, 60 days in the UK, which means for a particular year, you're not UK resident, technically. Um, in, in, in which case, you, you still hold a foreign passport, so you're, you won't get a personal allowance. Um, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a resident in the UK because you have indefinitely to remain, because you're entitled to stay there, um, then, then, then of course you, you'll get it. But if you're you have a Hong Kong passport, for instance, um, uh, and, and, and you have indefinitely to remain, but you've only spent three months in the UK, and that doesn't make you resident, then you won't get it in that year. But it's a year-on-year -year basis, so, so you know, so it, it can change depending on the circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, I see we're running short of time now, so time for a, a couple more questions, and then, um, yeah, I want to just understand what the poll question results were as well. Um, being asked what are the difficulties that non-resident companies find in getting loans for property purchases well it should be relatively straightforward um, for companies to get uh, mortgages within the UK um, all I'd say is that there are more choices available if you're buying in personal name and probably slightly better rates um, than if you are buying in corporate name um, just on that point, Jonathan, if, if I can add something, sure. I, I, I frequently am approached by people to on this question: How do I buy? Do I use a company or do I not? And and and, and there can be a lot of interesting and, and and good reasons why you might use a company, but but ultimately, I think as you alluded to earlier, it it, it it all comes down to to whether or not you're going to borrow money from a lender, um, because that can be the deal breaker. Everything can be. Great, but, but but the lender may not be willing to lend to a Hong Kong or a BVI company, overseas company. Um, that, and if they are, then it's a great opportunity for them to, to 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 bring down the loan to value and to hike up the rates as well, and to ask for big for big guarantees. So so it, it, it's it's while it looks great on paper and you can have a great discussion about it, in many cases it doesn't go ahead because because the lenders are not not willing to do it with an overseas company. It's a lot easier for UK companies uh, because you know they're there. They can look up the registry and is there a lot less risk in terms of the, from the lender's perspective yeah agreed um question quite a topical question actually i hold a bno passport and i'm using the visa to move to the uk should i use a company to buy or, or own the property in in my own name um i assume if you're buying it and you're moving to the uk you're going to live in it um therefore to benefit from the best rates you possibly can I would definitely buy in my own name um, and then you would you will avoid any additional tax on top of that is, is that a, is that a fair answer chris it is it, it is Jonathan. There, there's also another point there, there's something called it's a tax acronym it's called ATED, ATED annual tax on envelope dwellings so so it, in the event in, in most cases it, it, it makes sense to buy whatever the value if, if you're going to buy a home in the uk to, to live in to do it in your in your own name because otherwise the, if, if you buy the property in a company then this tax ATAD um, the, the property is considered enveloped in this company um, and, and, and the tax because if the, if the property is not rented out it's not receiving a rental income then this this is an annual tax on enveloped dwellings and, and, and it's equivalent to it's based on the kind of market rate of rent you pay tax on so you're treated effectively I mean it, it's tiered rates 3,000 750, 7,500, 15,000. It jumps up depending on the value of the property. But essentially it seeks to tax you on, 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 on the equivalent rental value of that property. So, so you'd, you'd be mad to buy it in a company. 
Okay, thank you. Um, just before we, we wrap up, I think we've got the answers to our, our poll questions. I've had a sneak preview. I don't know if they're going to come up on screen or um, if I should uh, say them now. Um, aha, okay, so this is the second one. Um, in terms of where people are, are looking to invest, London is still top of the tree, generally always is. But I think the UK commuter towns into London, I mean, that's, I would say if you had this conversation 12 months ago, that probably wouldn't have featured too strongly. But now, I mean, that's a, a close second. Um, for, for the reasons that we said earlier, I, I, certainly work practices have changed, are changing in the UK. Um, London is still London. People will still want to live there for sure. It's not just a work destination. It has he, he, so much, so many other things to offer as as do so many other big cities. But the fact of the matter is that um, you don't have to be tired to live as, as, as close as you possibly can to prevent a, a journey in and out every day. So um, we will certainly be investing more, investigating more into the um, commuter towns as we will also be um, investing again back into London. As I said earlier, uh, earlier, I think really what's happened since 2016, it's sort of paused for breath couple of black swan events that have affected the market there. The first was Brexit. The second obviously has been COVID, um, but still the activity is now starting to, to, to come back. So we are looking carefully at that again. Um, in terms of the second question, or the first question I should say, did we feel that the, the budget was, was friendly or not, um, or positive or negative? Um, I think most people do think it's positive, um 60 percent when we were checking early we were chatting earlier on weren't we chris saying that probably the the most unfriendly one that we can remember was back in 2015 when all of a sudden um non-residents were faced with the prospect of paying capital gains tax in the uk um and that was closely followed by the additional three percent stamp for uh, any additional properties um mm. which yeah sort of stunned the market temporarily but I think the key behind all of this is that if you do compare um, transaction costs um, and general tax benefits of, of investing in UK stroke London stroke any other um, city within the UK compared to, I don't know, Paris or New York or Singapore or Hong Kong, um, you know, UK is still definitely on the cheaper end of transaction costs, certainly if you're a non-resident, for example. Yes, we've got that additional 2% stamp, but you're paying double stamp in some countries if you're not mm. a resident there, which effectively shuts the door. Um, there's no wealth tax there, so you're not paying a, a sort of costly annual fee every year, which you would be in, say, somewhere like New York. Um, the transaction costs, sometimes they're in well into double digits, even at the lower end in some of the countries that we look at. So, yeah, I think the general consensus is UK is maybe not as friendly as it used to be, but it's still a lot friendlier than most. Um, would you agree with that, Chris? Yes, definitely. I, I had a, a client that, that, that was looking to buy a property in Hong Kong. It's 30% stamp duty in a company. It, it's, it's crazy. Singapore here, it's kind of similar as well. It's, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, the, the government's inching it up in the UK. They're, 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 they're taking easy wins. They know they can charge it a bit more because there's a great demand. And as you say, it's, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's good value. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think um, it's probably time to, to, to wrap things up. I mean, I see we've still got another 35 questions that have been asked, probably mainly for you, Chris. Um, so we will do our best to answer all of those questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining us today. I hope you were able to get something out of it. Um, as I said, we will be sending out the slides to anyone that... Um, that, that asks for those, requests those. I'm very happy to share that information. Um, and I wish you all a very good evening and look forward to speaking with you again soon at our next webinar. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to you, Chris, for joining us. Thanks for inviting me and thank you all for, for, for joining. Have a good night. Thank you.